That's how I feel about him. But he's such a beautiful, beautiful person. And I have the honor of being in his company one-on-one. -on -one and, you know, sometimes when I go to pick a ride in the car and hearing his humor. But he's still a genius to me. He's still a genius because he sits and he just comes forth with the information. But yet, he hasn't gotten too high to leave his people. He's always willing to come here to the House of the Lord Church to give us the word. Let us stand and give a House of the Lord welcome and an African welcome to our great elder statesman, Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Each day as I read the newspaper and listen to news reports, I feel like coming back and explaining almost by the week because you cannot understand your world until you understand the whole world. Until you understand what is happening, if you understand the tyranny of words, until you lose your romance with words in the mouth of bigots. When you use the word democracy, you mean one thing. Other people use it, they mean another thing. When you use your word Christian, they mean one thing. You mean another thing. We have to get these words together in order to get the situation together. You think what is happening in Europe has nothing to do with you. This is tribal warfare. But when whites fight, when white tribes fight, you don't call that savagery. You think it's an argument between communism and capitalism. Europe is repositioning itself in order to continue to rule the world. They're going to rule it whether it's communism or capitalism. Now, my subject for tonight is the European origins of black oppression. And we have not looked at these origins. We have not acknowledged how rich we are, how culturally rich we are, how spiritually rich we are. We haven't acknowledged the fact that we are the prize of the whole world. And being so culturally rich and spiritually rich and materially rich, we are a prize that all the rest of the world wants. Then if we are such a prize, Maybe you would wonder why is it that the Russians and the Americans would have summits, that they would have world conferences about people without mentioning us. And we are the greatest prize in the world. Their world rose based on what they took away from us. Every empire they ever had was contingent on how much they took from us. We, not understanding the tyranny of words, have bought words like minority, something we are not and never were. 
We have looked at the European as the bringer of the light. He's the bringer of darkness. We have looked at his bringing us a farm under the guise of religion as a new spiritual way of life and his religion is a farm without spirituality. And if you want to understand what I'm saying, don't put any lemon in lemonade. What have you got? A glass of water. So when he produces a farm called religion, he's producing a power apparatus to capture your mind, to give you the illusion that he is religious. And it is an element of control. And what you fail to understand is that you've got what he is missing. You got religion with spirituality. And religion without spirituality is a worthless form. And you had spirituality before he had the form. We have to look at ourselves. Then we have to look at ourselves before we know, we knew he existed. Now use your imagination a little bit because over half of human history was over before anyone knew that anybody in the world called a European existed. Over half of all human history was over. Didn't even know he was in the world. You had already created spirituality. You'd already created the city. You'd already created dynasties. And you had already recognized something that he still refused to recognize. That no society can be truly great unless it also uses the mind of its female population in partnership with his men. All of this has happened now before you know he, he existed. The female God had already been created. You'd already acknowledge that if you have a God, you've got to have a goddess. And that the female is the counterbalance of a male. And that man is only half until he's balanced in relationship to a female. You did not argue about superiority and inferiority. You would not do that because you were intelligent. Because that's like arguing against your mother. And you would not dare be stupid enough to say, that you are superior to the woman that gave you birth. He would do this because he's afraid of women. Still afraid of them. So he had to find a place for her less than his place. And when he enslaved the world, he enslaved her too. It's just that sometime her auction block had air condition. <laughs> but it was still an auction block. Okay. We don't often enough look at the world we lived in before our encounter with the people of Europe. Before we encountered the people of Europe, we had already produced an enduring society that lasted thousands of years 
without a jail system. Not only without a jail, without a word in our language that meant jail. So that means we had humanity, we had developed a method of dealing with crime and punishment without locking people into something that they would later call a jail. And man got so much human respect within his society, within his group. This retarded crime because no man wanted to bring disgrace on his group. Individualism was unknown. You behave in concert with the collective that was the total group. If you belong to group A, you will not do anything that will bring disgrace on group A. You brought some of the same values to the United States. Because if, if someone on the block saw you drunk, it brought disfavor to the entire family. So you tried to behave in a manner that reflected good on the entire family. Now, the crisis today in relationship to the family and in relationship to the man, when the man had the manhood role, he could stabilize the structure of the family. That does not mean he was a man with a whip, he was a man with responsibility. And there were others with responsibility to him. And if you understand the economics of what is happening to us, you'd understand the breaking up of that structure. A lot of service jobs are being eliminated. And some service jobs are being taken away. Just on the train to Washington the other day, here's a cracker boy. Handling the snack bar. Those jobs used to be exclusively ours. Another time, a cracker girl handling the snack bar. Those jobs were ours on, only for years. We had a monopoly on certain jobs, certain basic jobs, and we did not lose these jobs because we did not do them well. We lost them because they wanted to appease the poor whites and women by giving them jobs, so they took the jobs from us. Now, this caused erosion in our structure. It is difficult for a man to stand up and play his role as a man if he don't have the means of putting shoes on his child. All of this is deliberate to destabilize you so that you will lose the ability to being responsible. Now, I had this in my own family over the, over the Christmas. My older niece, expecting twins. She's got a husband, a little cavalier, but he's a husband and he's there. And he, <laughs> He don't seem to take life too seriously, but he does support his family and hold down a job and he comes home reasonably on time. <laughs> the middle niece was going with a fellow who was going to marry her, changed his mind. He's got a car. He didn't even take her to the doctor for the postnatal care didn't contribute so much as the price of a bottle of milk. His mo the girl's mother said, 
the boy has a right to see his child. The men of the family gathered and had a caucus and said if he's not responsible for nothing in the family, we question whether he has a right. Then we told them, either you show us some responsibility for this girl and this child, or we going to put a hurting on you. <laughs> Look, it is high time that we understand, no matter what Oprah Winfrey and her crowd says, no matter what Donahue says, no matter what is said on somebody else's show about the vanishing family, in the final analysis, when something is done, black men are going to have to confront black men. We're going to have to do it like the tribe. If you belong to this tribe, you have certain responsibility. You shoulder that responsibility or you put space between you and the tribe. Or we expel you from the tribe. You, be, you take care of your manhood responsibility. When you touch a woman in a personal way that will bring a child into the world, you are about to change the whole world. The world will never be the same. You have touched a gene pool. You open up a gene pool. There's the basis of a generation. This young man might be a killer, and he might be a saint. He might be a great theologian, and he might be a con man. Depending on your reaction to him, how you train him, and how you socialize him. And while there are many women doing good jobs at raising young men, no man's socialization is complete unless another man plays a role in that socialization. I'm not even arguing about whether he's married or not. Married to or not, I wish they would. But because I had so many uncles and cousins and my socialization was so broad, even if my father wasn't there, he was there, but even if he wasn't there, Uncle Willie, Uncle Henry, all those uncles, all those males zeroing into me and all the females pampering me, and they had to snatch me from them to keep them from spoiling me. I mean, all of this gave me a personhood I would never have had. Don't you know what it means to a child's ego? When people are, no, come up, that, 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 that boy is taking you out of that one's lap, taking that, then men taking you for a walk and telling you about you know, life and your responsibility. And the uncle's coming to the house and each one giving you a nickel and watching you to see what you're going to do with it. And you put, put all the nickels in the piggy bank except one and you go buy a bottle, box of ginger snaps and you eat them all except one for each child left and you give, give out your one and you, you, you're wise now. You, you save most of your money. You only spend a nickel. So they're prophesying for you. Well, this boy's gonna be something. Got a head on his shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> That's good for your ego. And you're walking down the street, you pass a porch where you've done little chores for a lady. And they're talking, but they don't they think you're kinda out of earshot. That little bubble clock, boy, that boy gonna be a leaf. That boy gonna be something in the world. <coughs> Studies well in school, gets his lessons too. 
All that time I was so poor I had paper in my shoes. But somebody loved me. Yeah. Somebody invested something in me. Someone had hope for me. And for a man to be whole, for a human being to be a whole man or woman, someone must invest something into them. Some hope, some kindness, some gentle touches, and some stern discipline. If there's just as much love sometimes as a switch as in a hug, depending on the administration of it. Am I going away from the subject, the truth about the matter? No. I'm talking about what we did in spite of oppression. In fact, any people survive what we have to survive will stay on this earth for a long time. Faith has preserved us to deliver a message to this world. Otherwise, we would have been gone. Other people suffered less than we have suffered. They're gone. Nobody here, not even a name of them. They're gone. Why are we still here? Why did we endure? Inasmuch as we have had very few friends, every alliance we ever made with another people been betrayed. Everybody lied to us. All kind of fakery has been palmed off on us. Nobody tried to spare us, and yet we've increased while they've decreased. <laughs> they were about dipping into our gene pool because that gene pool is getting weak. They're not reproducing themselves <laughs> well enough. I'm talking about when we reproduce ourselves, we must care for the reproduction. When we bring children into the world, we must care for them. We must give attention to the child. Now let's go to the heart of the subject. Our relationship with non-African people from the very beginning was bad and still is. I have said something that a lot of people think is a little harsh. I said there were three personality types emerged in the world. The sand people, Western Asia, Arab types. The sun people, the African. And the ice people, the European. I said that leave each one in his habitat the world would have been better. There are different temperaments in these people that maybe one supposed to mix. And the mixing of these temperaments have done damage. Right now, Africans in the Sudan are being killed for no other reason than the fact that they are Africans and non-Muslims. Africans in, the, in Ethiopia being killed for no other reason than the fact that they are Muslims and not Christian. I'm saying that no religion that is proper sanction any form of murder. Who turned religions into murder cults? Most of them. And it's the foreigners misunderstanding our spirituality and spirituality in general that turn religion into murder cults. We have to take religion back to its spiritual base and give the world a message in faith that will save it. And we have the humane capacity to do so. Europe has lost that capacity. So if you're turning to them, <laughs> no matter what cause something another said, 
They lack the capacity even to be good socialists if they, if they think that's the answer. Why do we have the capacity? Because that's what we were before Carl, even for <coughs> Europe. <laughs> and African Akhenaten preached from a throne to each according to his needs 1,300 years before the birth of Christ. Now, Africa existed until 16, 8, 1675 B.C. Africa had no foreign influence. There were no foreigners in Africa influencing anything. There were no foreigners in Africa building anything. The Hebrew visitors came in the 1700s B.C. The invaders came in the 1600s B.C. Now we are talking about the entry of Western Asian people who ultimately is going to set up Africa for the coming of the Europeans. If you got any Arab romance, you might as well put it on the shelf. I didn't say don't be a Muslim, be anything you want to be so long as you be it well. But if you got any romance that that's your friend, you misread history. You'd be a better Muslim without him. All right, now. My main point is that these Western Asians in collusion with the early Hebrews, their clerks and collaborators misunderstood the structure of Africa, misunderstood the family structure, misunderstood the loyalty system and they began a process that plagued us to this very day, bastardization. Most people wish I'd stop talking about it. <laughs> but I was in Jamaica a few day, a few weeks ago. Jamaicans want to be everything except Africans. <laughs> They would tell you about their Dutch uncle, Scottish father, grandfather, everything. And yet here is an African nation away from home that has missed its place in history because they misunderstood who they are. And yet I have met young Jamaicans born in England from Jamaican parents who've had their tail kicked around enough by the British who let them know that though you were born here, we don't consider you English. <laughs> Some of those young people are clear about who they are and what they have to be. And for the first time I see a goodly number of them back in Jamaica doing business. And I don't mean store business. I mean ideological business. Setting the record straight. Working for youth papers, working in government offices. Not flinching, not caring about whether they, they fired or not. Even trying to straighten out the rasters, you know what a difficult job that's going to be. <laughs> Darren say that some rascals are rascals, and some of them are. So a new generation is beginning to emerge who's going to look at the record and find a definition of who they are. Now let's go back to these invaders.
because this is the beginning of setting up Africa for other invaders. This is the beginning of a long years of oppression, the beginning of the long siege. We as a people have always had something other people wanted, think they can't do without, and don't want to pay for. <laughs> they begin to see now our great riches. We walking around with gold. We with clumps of gold, we study our horse. We want the horse to be still, we leave, leave him here, we put down a big clump of gold and put the rings in the clump of gold and you're going on the way, not even guarding it. People, this rich. I got to take them over. And sooner or later, that's what happened. They came as friends and stayed as conquerors. All right, now, Africa drove out these first invaders. Then finally, the Africans said to the remaining group, either you obey African law or you go. And those who did not want to obey African law decided to go. Now, you know the biblical basis of the Exodus. I'm telling you the historical basis of the Exodus. You keep your version, I keep mine. <laughs> they had been in Africa, bedded down with African women, produce a generation of mixed people, converted a lot of Africans to the Hebrew faith that was an African faith to begin with. They came into Africa, I'm talking about the Hebrew entry now. They came into Africa with no clear idea of a faith, no clear idea of a language, no clear idea of a culture. When they left, they had all three led by an African, a prince who grew up in an African household named Moses, who would palm off on them in African religion when he would tell them, obey my God, I'll be your leader. He gave them the concept that he had learned in Africa, the concept of monotheism, the concept of the oneness of God. The Africans had one great spiritual being, but a lot of God serving the one God. We haven't looked at this. We look at it, the Catholic Church gave you the same thing, you, you consider it. Only they call the help of saints. You consider this. But the African has one overall spiritual being. If he has a God for the rain, he don't make that God responsible for the sun. He never overworked the gods. God for female fertility, another God has male fertility. All right, now let's look at the, the, the whole arrangement of the Catholic Church. One saint hounds the sailors. That's the job of that saint, take care of the sailors. One saint takes care of the poor. Look at the sainthood of the, African, uh, of the Catholic Church and look at the responsibility of the gods under the vast, under the major spiritual god in, in, in Africa. You see, you see the origins of it. It's hard for you to conceive with your Western mind and your brainwashing. There's so much that you think is white that's been painted white started in Africa. All right, now, with the coming, with the going out of Africa of those who decided not to obey African law, with the revival of African freedom after the exodus of the conqueror and the visitor, you had a thousand years 
of peace and freedom. 1,000 years in the life of a people is a long time. The 19th dynasty came and went with Ramesses in the last of the mighty pharaohs of the north. During the 25th dynasty, three great pharaohs came from the south, Castor, Pianchi, Tahaka. After they were driven back to the south, mainly Tahaka, because Tahaka had went into Western Asia to rescue the Jews, but someone was beating up on the Jews. Now, why did he stay home? He take that mighty African army way over there in Western Asia, called, mistakenly called the Middle East. And they had heavier weapons. The African was fighting with a bronze weapon. He, they had pig iron weapons. Most of the iron mostly came from Africa, but Africa hadn't made that kind of weapon. The pushing of Tahaka to the south, the Africans drew an arbitrary line to keep them from coming further to the south. The golden age, that second golden age was over. Now, in 1665 and six, not 16, but six, 65 and six, the Assyrians, now called Syrians, if you got any romance with the people of Western Asia, Lebanese and all those, if you got any romance there, think again. These are the people who set up Africa for Europe. The Assyrians came again, disrupting Africa. They were so bad that another conqueror conquered them from Iran, the Iranians, under a king named Cambyses, 550 BC. They were so bad until the Africans cried out, oh Lord, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show mercy. It is at this time that the young Macedonian Alexander, sometimes referred to as the great, knocked at the door. He didn't have to knock very hard. The Africans so tired of those Western Asians, they wouldn't have given somebody else a chance. Now, how much damage did Alexander do? He was still a conqueror. He raided the granaries of Egypt to feed the army. Egypt was a great agricultural country. Greece was not a great agricultural country. At no time in Greece history was it a great agricultural country. He wanted to see some of the great thinkers of Africa, the oracles. And he wanted to go down south, see one of the great master teachers. These master teachers would enter school when they were seven. They would be examined 40 years later to see if they, could, if they are qualified to continue in school. If they continued, they continued until they were 70 and they were senior oracles, great teachers. They weren't paid any salary. Everything they needed was given to them even porters to take their luggage from one city to the other if they wanted to travel. Everybody considered it an honor to feed a great teacher. This was a great flowering intellectual age. Alexander wanted to see one, wanted to talk to one, to ask one question of these great men. He knew, and he said so in a letter to his mother, Africa was the origin of Greek culture. Africa was the home of Zeus and Apollo. Africa was the home of their gods. And while sometimes I'm not so harsh on Alexander, is that he acknowledged 
the intellectual and the spiritual origins of Greece as being in Africa. The, or the oracle would see him, of course, the boy is too young, and they'd come back in 20 years, maybe he'd be intelligent enough to ask the kind of question I might want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> A young man, 31, 32 years old, want to ask me a question, and I spent, I spent 40 years in school. <laughs> I spent more years in school than he's been on earth. <laughs> so he refused him. He didn't go south. Alexander began to marry some of the Greek generals into Egyptian royalty. This is the beginning of the decline now. This is the beginning of the confusion about who you are. The beginning of this breaking up of the royal family structure that's going to lead to the breaking up of the indigenous general family structure. The foreigner does not understand Africa's foreigners family structure, he, in, he installs his own. Don't even understand African food, so he brings his own. Don't understand the family structure in relationship to women because you go to her family to get permission and her family goes to your family. It's a, it, it is a negotiation between two families, not between two people. This was before the I love you marriage. <laughs> the romantic marriage is a Western invention. The I respect you marriage, people got married for reason other than other than love, because that, that's a, that can come and go. When you marry and with the consent of two branches of the family, and they put a support system behind both of you, and there's no word in your language meaning divorce, if you got any problem, you go to the uncles and go to that, that family structure. And they, they, they get it thrashed out. This is I respect you marriage. I didn't say romance didn't exist. I'm saying the basis for them coming together wasn't romance. But bringing two families together, bringing two bloodlines together, and sometimes bringing two herds of cattle together, and a lot of sheep and goats together, and bringing a village together, stopping a war. He stopped the war by taking a prince from this side and a princess from that side. And had a big ceremonial marriage. And we all now belong to the same family. We have to stop fighting. <laughs> Isn't this better than killing people? What have these two young people created? A gene pool. They can give birth to a generation. Now the foreigner did not understand that. The pollution of Africa's bloodlines and custom began with these foreigners. Alexander was the first purely European who didn't understand this. Finally, he decided he would go south. He had a habit of marching that magnificent Greek army to the borders of countries and telling a king, come out and see what kind of army you're going to fight. The king see all those Greeks, all those lances, all those horses. He just sh shake his head. Oh, my God, I can't deal with that. Surrenders his country. When Alexander decided to go south, a queen of Ethiopia, Candice, sent 40,000 of her finest troops to parade before him. Then a general handed him a note. If you want to come down south, I got some more soldiers to show you. <laughs> <laughs> he 
You didn't go south. Went to India. Went to Asia. There where he died in a drunken stupor, arguing with his African commander, generally left out of history, Cletus Nigra. You got to read your J.A. E. Rogers. I know a whole lot of people don't even know that Rogers was a Jamaican. <laughs> Rogers was a Jamaican, a farmer soldier in the First World War and walked like one to the day he died. <laughs> Rogers was 86, straight as a stick, walking down the street and bowling, shoulders back, you know. <laughs> 86 years old. <laughs> died later the same year. One of the great good fortune that has come to me is that I've got to know so many people personally. <laughs> and I got to know so many Caribbean people of caliber, especially the writers. A lot of people know me for 40 years and don't know that I'm not a West Indian. <laughs> They get to me and talk about it. <laughs> Start to gossip about those other people. <laughs> I just listen. <laughs> I just listen. <laughs> now, with the death of Alexander, the oppression of Africa by the Greeks he left behind continued. He had accidentally killed his African commander, Cletus Nigra. These Greeks mismanaged, married their sisters, killed the brothers, misunderstood Egyptian m marriage of the sister. When Egyptian royalty marries his sister, he's marrying his sister or brother to keep the royal lineage in the family. When you marry a sister, you didn't cohabit with your sister. He you found another wife for that purpose. The Greeks didn't understand that. <laughs> they started a whole lot of cross-current stuff that they're confused about to this very day. <laughs> All right, now, the Greeks became so intellectual, they began to neglect the army. Next door to them was a bunch of thugs who still thugs. This is the forerunners of the mafia. Couldn't read, couldn't write, but could fight like hell. <laughs> Took them over. <coughs> Took over the Greek trading post. Reduced the Greeks to clerks. Many Roman generals captured Greek teachers. Reduced them to slavery and sent the Greek teacher home to teach his family how to read and write after he taught the Greek, the general how to read and write. Now we have the Romans. And the Roman was one of the supreme oppressors of the world. <coughs> they were very insecure people. They wasn't contented with sharing the Mediterranean with the Africans. They didn't want part of the trade. They wanted all of it. The people of Sicily who were married to Africans, especially the people at Carthage, the people of Africa married to the people of Sicily. Look at an Italian today who call himself a Sicilian. Look at his complexion. Look at the structure of his face. Then look at Cousin Willie. <laughs> Go 
those are cousins. And they enjoyed being cousins. And when the rest of the Romans wanted to fight the Africans, especially the Carthaginians, over trade, the people of Sicily didn't want to fight. They're separated from the rest of, rest of Italy to this day. Now the Mafia started legitimately enough. The people of southern Italy, who are made basically brown skin and sometimes black to this day, fighting against those light skins in the north. It, was, it started as a real protection organization. It, was, it had nothing to do with gangsters. It was a form of tribal chauvinism or tribal protection. This would continue until the Hannibal's father told Hannibal, he was boy of 12 then, and some mean people across that ocean. You better bring the battle to them before they bring it to you. And he grew up, he grew up with this in mind. The Romans had one thing in mind, the destruction of that great commercial city across that water that had robbed it of, of all the trade. Finally, the Romans made a cult out of the cry, Carthage must be destroyed, passed each other on the street. Good morning, Roman citizen. Good morning, Roman citizen. Carthage must be destroyed. Yes, citizen. Carthage must be destroyed. Nobody ever said why. <laughs> History has not given us any reason other than need and greed and pure historical gangsterism for the destruction of Carthage. One of the most stupid wars in history they would have gotten more out of it had they just engaged in a trade, a trade agreement. No, they wanted it all. Hannibal grew up, took an army, and held Rome at bay for 17 long years. Knocked at the Roman door, at the door of Rome, but didn't knock it open. Didn't seem to want to. Why is it that when we've got other people at our feet, we don't destroy them and humiliate them? Why is it every time we are down, people humiliate us? When do we learn? It is something humane about us that prevents us from delivering the knockout blow. Just knocking him down seems to be enough, then we walk away. We let him lay there long enough to get his strength up. If he comes up and we don't, we didn't see him pick up a weapon and knock the hell out of him. <laughs> and yet we keep on. This is why the first Punic Wars started at sea, about 246 BC. Hannibal's father tried to interfere with the Romans who were indeed stopping the ships of the people of Sicily trading with the Africans. The people of Sicily did not want to fight the Africans. The Romans would whip them into line Later on, after 17 years, they got themselves partly together. Hannibal had come over the Arabs with the elephants. They pushed the old lion back at home. Now back at home, he must protect his own territory. Europe still has designs on his country. One African, Masinaceus, this seemed like stupid reasons. 
had a thing for Hannibal's sister. And she didn't like him for beans. So he wouldn't help Hannibal. Another half African, skipping your Africanus. Also had eyes on her and she couldn't see him. And she said that, Masinacea said that she had spread rumor about her and a Roman that she did not have any relationship with. Dr. Ben, who can get a little harsh sometimes, <laughs> said that she was a lady of the evening and not even worth talking about. <laughs> She's worth talking about because the rumor about her and two men pursuing her unsuccessfully changed history. That's why she's worth talking about. Her character notwithstanding will leave for others to judge. But my main point here is that when the Roman army came down, Hannibal's left flank was exposed and his right flank was exposed. And this man who was one of the great natural warriors in the history of the world, and one of the strongest physical men of that day, if his men had to sleep in mud, he slept in mud. He never asked for any privileges over and above that of his own men. He ate what they ate, slept what they had to sleep. He endured every hardship that they had to endure. And he engendered a kind of loyalty over and above that of a general. And when he went into Italy, he spent 17 years He's fighting the Romans, and yet there are Roman common people supporting him, finding leather for the shoes, finding food to replenish his army. I did a talk called Hannibal and Howard Beach, <laughs> showing that if it takes one of our drops of blood to make you a whole one of us, Hannibal, get, in, in the 17 years, his soldiers got the urge. They didn't go all the way back to Africa to satisfy the urge. <laughs> so therefore, they began to visit the Italian ladies and deposit some children. And maybe the real issue at, Hannibal, at, 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 at Howard Beach, that these Italian mulattoes are running from being accepted as part of us. All right, now, with the defeat of Hannibal, aggressive European oppression would start. The Romans would move into Africa and destroy everything in sight the city of Carthage. That was the greatest commercial city of its day, had viaducts, water supply, all of the, these things. They would not only destroy the city, but they would plow salt into the earth so that they could even grow crops. It's the forerunner of Asian art. The temperament of the European never changes from one age to the other. He is indeed the ice man. <laughs> now when they moved into, into North Africa, they established themselves in a country now called Tunis. And if you go there, you can see the ruins of their amphitheaters. You see the ruins of their buildings. Once they established themselves, they made a cult out of Roman citizenship. Africans bidding for Roman citizenship. 
and forgetting the values as Africans. Look at this and look at the stupidity we played over integration and you'll understand what I'm saying. <laughs> we wanted to be everything except like our, just to get close to one of those people, just to sit near them, just to eat in the same restaurant. The food can be lousy, but I'm here with them. <laughs> You deserted all those good black restaurants where those sisters knew how to cook. <laughs> all those nice, small, but very clean black hotels we used to have, gone out of business. Are you running to eat all that pasty food, all dressed up and tasting like I'm showing you where you started this act way back then. <laughs> to be a Roman citizen meant something to you. So many blacks became Roman citizens. In the political Roman Empire, three blacks became emperors. September Savers being the most noted, who's buried in England at York followed by his son, Caracalla, who's also buried in England. We was out Roman the Romans. <laughs> we were striving to be those things most unlike ourselves. That was the trap we, we were in then, that's the trap we're in right now. <laughs> During the Holy Roman Empire, was three African popes. And don't think that African emperors ruled Rome, or African popes ruled the Holy Roman Empire. The Romans ruled them. The Roman Empire was multi-ethnic, but the Romans ruled it until it fell. They were very clear about this. You talking about one man, one vote, multi-ethnic, Black and white unite. There ain't nothing you need to talk about in South Africa but African power. <laughs> if you are willing to stay under African power and African law, all right. Otherwise, the door that lets you in will let you out. <laughs> Failing that, if you love Africa so much, we will give you a peace that you can keep permanently. <laughs> the length of your body from head to toe. <laughs> if your enemy had to be guaranteed that he's going to be safe after you are free. He will be safe if he obeys your laws and respect your power. Other than that, he ain't got no business being safe. <laughs> and you are a fool if you make him safe otherwise. That's what's wrong with Zimbabwe right now, but that's another lecture. <laughs> My main point is that aggressive European oppression had started with the Romans and that these Romans in their tax collecting made Africans question old gods and turn to new gods and they pulled out of their folklore the concept of a god born in a manger. This was a story they have been telling for years. It was an old Babylonian story also. So they took some people and fitted those people inside the context of the story and personified them within the context of the story. 
There used to be a great black tax collector in New York, Charlie Anderson. He said that everything is a tax story. Man went to the ninth grade. He was collecting taxes, internal revenue, first district, Wall Street. I told him about Mayor and Joseph going to be county. He said, that's a tax story. <laughs> oh, my God, I never thought about it. It is a tax story. The Romans bled Africa dry with its taxes. Roman taxes could have been the stimulant for this new religion. But once the new religion got underway, and Africans became converts to the new religions, the Romans laughed at them. Any time any European tried to convert you to Christianity, please remind him of the 300 years they killed Christians for being Christians. <laughs> there were more Africans killed in the amphitheaters of North Africa for being Christians than in the arena in Rome. Why don't we know about the Africans? Someone wrote a romantic literature about the killing of the Christians in the arena in Rome. No one did the same thing about the Africans. This is why Petha, this is why the great black women in early Christianity got lost. The woman who started the Sunday school, the concept that became the Sunday school. Laws from history. And once the Romans stopped killing Christians and became Christians, they declared war on the African Christians for the control of the church. No matter where the European is on the face of the earth, he never shares power. This is an illusion we've got about South Africa. There were European never live where he have to share power with a non-European. The mere fact that the African is in power guarantees you he's going to wreck that power or he's going to get out. You have to be very clear about this, and this is why you have to emphasize African power and no one man, one vote. I mean, <laughs> No, one, this is admirable to have one man, one vote. I'm not knocking it, but that's not the main issue. The main issue is African power, the ability to determine direction, the ability to make decisions and make it stick, the ability to walk the earth and let the world know this is my country, all of it, every grain of sand, every leaf of grass, Every tree is all mine. And I determine the direction of everything here. In the final analysis, the essence of power is the ability to include and exclude. And if you don't have that ability, you have no power. And if someone else determines it for you, you are a slave. If someone else restricts your movement, you are a slave. The condition of being a slave is not just the condition of working hard. It's a whole lot of people work hard who are not slaves. The condition of being a slave is not, this, not just the condition of being hungry. There's a whole lot of people who are hungry who are not slaves. The condition of being a slave is having the status of not being able to determine your own destiny. Now, after the Romans adopted Christianity, after the Romans won the war to control the apparatus of Christianity, 
after Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Eastern Roman Empire, Christianity became a political instrument for European power. This is why your Christianity cannot be the same as his. Your church cannot be the same as his because your church has something his church hasn't got. Your church has spirituality. <laughs> and that's what saves your church, spirituality. That great deal of difference. Now, the Romans mismanaged this religion so terribly, fighting among themselves until they were about, they lost confidence. About 450 BC, about, about 450 AD, the Romans had begun to lose hold. A bunch of Germans called Vandals came down to deal with the, with the Romans. The Romans had propagated a concept that they were invincible and no one could defeat them. The thing about the Vandals, the Vandals not only didn't know about it, the Vandals couldn't read anyway. And so they began to kick Roman tails, and after the Vandal period, Roman power didn't mean anything. They would coast another hundred years on their reputation. Finally, early in the 600s A.D., a camel boy began to grumble with other camel boys. And he began to ask for reform. Failing to get reform, he asked for a new religion. And the new religion was Islam. Islam drove Europeans, drove Romans out of Africa blocked the Mediterranean and gained control of the trade. Europeans now had to go back into Europe and feed on themselves. The Roman Empire was no more. Islam brought a new force into Africa, thanks to Zayd bin Harith, the great military man of Islam, an Ethiopian. Bilal, the first Mazum, the first to call the prayers, an Ethiopian. <coughs> Anta, the first literary man of Islam. A, a black Persian. Thanks to the fact that Ethiopia sheltered that religion until it could get itself together in Arabia and become a religion. This gives you some idea of the role of African people in getting the religion underway. Therefore, in getting the religion underway, why are we now going into the back door of this religion with an arrow's permission without understanding the Arab is the most corrupt element within Islam. <laughs> Why have we devoted so little time to the great black characters within Islam? Why do we boast so much about Islam? We know nothing about Zaid bin Hadid. We know nothing about Tarek bin Azad who was Muslim and the real conqueror of Spain. The Rock of Gibraltar is named after him. I'm saying that 
European oppression was stopped for the moment because Europeans had to deal with themselves. And while European oppression was stopped, Africans would build a third golden age in inner West Africa called the Western Sudan. And people, I would appreciate it if the fellows are talking, would just please let me lecture. I, don't, I, I thank you very much. These kingdoms in the Western Sudan, totally neglected by most historians, Ghana, Mali, Sangay just have to be the most important. But there were other kingdoms, there were Yoruba kingdoms, there were the Shanti kingdoms, the kingdom of Old Olio, there were kingdoms within kingdoms. There were great Muslim kingdoms. There's a great Mar Muslim kingdom in what is now Mauritania, usurped by the Arabs who now who still have the slave trade in Mauritania. There were coward, there are coward black Muslims today who will not confront the fact that the Arab is still a slave trader. And the killing and the driving of Senegalese out of Mauritania in less than a year ago have not caused anything, any flutter among them. I don't want to belong to anything that can kill my brothers and sisters where I have to keep quiet. But after over a thousand years of these great kingdoms, these great river civilizations in Africa, Europe began to rise again, thanks to information taken from the University of Salamanca in Spain. Europe began to turn on the Africans who had preserved this information. She learned longitude and latitude again. Having learned longitude and latitude again, Europe went out to sea. Europe began to search for spices and sweets of Asia. They discovered Africa and all of its wonder on the way. Europe once more is becoming the world's oppressor. In the 15th and the 16th century, they made an agreement who will ever whosoever controls the world is going to be one of us. Might be a European who calls himself a capitalist, might be a European who calls himself a Christian, might be a European who calls himself an atheist, might be a European who calls himself a fascist, but it's going to be a European. You think what is happening in Europe today means liberalism. It is tribal warfare. You don't call it tribal warfare when Europeans are engaged into it. You put that tag, this tag only on Africans. The European is realizing something. That most of the human race is non-European. Once the African gained control over all his diamonds and gold and manganese and cobalt, and walk into the councils of the world and begin to deal, he's going to change the economic structure of the world. There are 20 nations in Africa that have more than the Japanese started with, and they're not even producing a safety pin. <laughs> I have said before, if you want to start an economic system, start by producing your underwear. Why underwear? Nobody's looking at it. It's covered up. So if you don't get the seams right at first, you can straighten them out later. <laughs> Give us a little while. We'll, we'll produce the prettiest underwear. And when you undress before your favorite person, look better than the suit. <laughs> you'll start on the suit next then the shoes 
You're going to decide to produce your own food. You're gonna, all of a sudden, you're going to be self-sustaining. And at last, after many years, you would have heard what Booker D. Washington was trying to say. <laughs> These states fell in inner Africa because after the slave trade had already started, the king of Morocco, Il Mansu, who got help from Queen Elizabeth of England, who promised him, if you help me overthrow King Antonio of Spain, I will help you destroy the West the Sudan, Sangay, sent an army across that Sahara to destroy these independent states. Finally, he succeeded. It was Muslim against Muslim. Most Muslims don't want to open up this kettle of fish. And yet we better be honest with ourselves and find out what has been done to us in the name of religion. The European trade, slave trade came to us in the name of Christianity. The Arab slave trade came in the name of Islam. We must understand the misuse of religion. These people wasn't, you, wasn't obeying God's word. They were demeaning God's word. After this invasion, the slave trade spread inland. Africans were spread from all over the Western Hemisphere. The plantation economy of the West Indies at first rescued Europe from economic disaster. Two islands of Haiti and Jamaica literally rescued Europe. These islands were functioning and the system was functioning on these islands a hundred years before the first black arrived in America in Jamestown, Virginia. The preface to African American history is Caribbean history. We have to stop this nonsense about being a separate people. We all left Africa on the same slave ship. Stopped in the Caribbeans and dropped one off and one, one island, he became a Trinidadian. Dropped that one off, he became a Jamaica. Uh, he became a St. Kitsian. We were Africans when we left Africa. <laughs> the slave ship brought no St. Kitsians, brought no Jamaicans, brought no Trinidadians, brought no black Americans. And another thing you have to deal with, brought no high yallas and no low yallas. <laughs> No deltas, no AKAs, no Elks, no Shriners. All of us had to become what we thought we needed to become in order to survive. I'm not asking anyone to apologize. I'm not asking anyone to boast. But in the final analysis, we are all one people and we have to face the world as one people. We have to stop all of this nonsense about Dutch uncles and <laughs> Scottish grandfathers and, and a little drop of Indian. A bigoted cab driver downtown can tell you who you are. <laughs> he look and say, I'm not going to take you to Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to live in Hall. He ain't gonna take you every that means he ain't gonna take you any place. Now what are the possibilities of the survival of African people? Somewhere we've made the wrong turn in the road. Somewhere we misjudge ourselves. We reached the fork of the road and we saw many signboards that leading home. We might have gone down the wrong road. We might have to step back in order to go forward. 
we might have to go back to that figurative fork in the road and read those signboards again. And if we could find a signboard that says African, say African unity, Pan-Africanism, African people, if we can find just that signboard, just that message, if we can understand what Garvey was saying, what Du Bois was saying politically, what Marcus Garvey was saying internationally, and even what Elijah Muhammad was saying about nation, if we can understand our own messengers, we would find the signboard that leads us home and we could become a new and free people and we can first activate that humanity that we gave the world once and must give the world again if the world is going to continue to be worth living in. Thank you. Dr. Clark. Dr. John Henrik Clark. A master. Thank you, you may be seated. Dr. Clark's going to come back in a few minutes as soon as he gets himself together and asks us some questions for a short answer. Thank you. Oh, one other, other thing. Last Monday, Monday past, we did a tribute. There was a tribute done here to Brother Jichu Wayusi. Now, you all know who Jichu was, the person that they came down on in the campaign and all that stuff. But it did my heart good to see the African community come out and pay tribute to him. And we raised over $4,000 for that brother right here in this church. And there's a, there is a good story, a whole page story about him in today's Newsweek done by the sister Merrill English, who is a Jamaican sister, an African sister. And she's always writing something positive and the positive side of our community. And those of us who read that paper, and those who don't read that paper, I think we should send a drop a line to the paper and commending her for her work that she does in journalism. That's Sister Merrill English, and it's in today's news, news, uh, news day, newspaper. And it's a full page uh, cover, and it's got a beautiful picture of our chief, like we call him. And he looks like a chief, resplendent in his black suit and his white beard and his gray hair. He looks just like he is a chief sitting in that picture. And I opened the paper this morning, I said, oh, wow. And I saw it, and it was great. And I think if you haven't seen the article, you should get the paper or get the article out or call them and ask them for a back issue. And write that paper in commending this sister, Merrill English. Thank you. respect to you, I would like to say also that the only person I have known who seemed to have approached the caliber uh, was the late Dr. Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is to you, Dr. Clark, is this. Can you comment on the fact that the bulk of African history is stored away in accessible places in the paper archive of uh, the Vatican and also in governmental storages in Germany. That's correct. Well, that's, that's true. In fact, uh, most of African documents are outside of Africa. But England probably holds the greatest number of 
valid documents on African history that it fails to use in its textbooks and its schools. But the Germans became uh, special collectors of African documents. And there were three German writers uh, hearing in about 1835, uh, he published a uh, five volume economic history of the world. And uh, his fourth volume deals with the history of the commercial intercourse between the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and the Carthaginians. And there was uh, Henry Bach, who traveled into Af Africa and wrote Travels and Discoveries in North and in Central Africa, and Frobenius, who wrote near the end of the century. But the field notes of these Germans, because Germans are so meticulous in collecting notes and during the time the Germans had colonies in Africa, uh, they alphabetized most of the languages and they sent anthropologists and paleontologists in, into Africa and they really collected some knowledge on Africa that other people hadn't, hadn't got and uh, most of that material is still in Germany. Frobenius's five-volume history of Africa never been translated it's been condensed into two volumes called the Voice of Africa. Uh, but there are other nations. France also has a lot of the work of Delafosse. It's never been translated into English. It's, his work was condensed into a little book called The Negroes of Africa. Horrible title, but uh, but the works of, I think the most extensive work is published by the English, uh, Anacalypsis, which is a two-volume work dealing with the dispersion of African people throughout the world. But the role of our scholars is to learn these various languages and go into the archives. Um, no one has dug up the story of, uh, from the archives of Denmark, the real story of the Virgin Islands before the Americans took it over. You go into the Dutch archives because the Dutch was one of the most ruthless and bloodiest of the slave traders. A lot of people don't even know the Dutch were in the slave trade. The Scandinavians were in the slave trade. The Swedes. You need to go and look through the public records of these um, respective countries. And our history is just beginning to be told. Um, it is my understanding, though, that this information is inaccessible. What, in your opinion, is the reason or reasons for that? Well, actually, they don't want us, the certain thing they don't particularly want us to know. And, uh, and, uh, I think these things could be made available to us. I'm not above, if, give me enough money, I'm not above hiring a white spy to go in there and get it. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I want to know, was there at any one, t at, at any point, was Africa like all one instead of divided as it is now? And if so, was it, you know, like represented, you know, by a particular flag, anything like this, like red, black, and green, and red, yellow, and uh, green? Was it at one time, you know, just a whole? You see, the nation state, as we know it, is basically European. There were times when Africa was in harmony with itself, and not at war with itself. If that means whole, then the answer is, is, is yes. Africa did not go in greatly for flags as such. 
the flag is a part of the nation state, but Africa did go in for symbols and, um, and, and uh, different things that represent the spirituality of the state or represented the respective kingdoms uh, symbolically and uh, certain things that meant justice. But my, my, my point is that while Africa was never totally, all Africans have never been totally conscious of all Africa simultaneously uh, conscious of all, of all the Africans living in Africa, and they are not now. But because of modern communication, the Africans now know more about the people in Africa that lives beyond their respective boundaries. There were very few walls in Africa before the coming of the foreigners. I see. And I have one more question. The, uh, there seems to be a uh, conflict of interest as far as like what might have been the original name for Africa or, you know, something close to, you know, before Africa, mm. for what I understand. I think this, this conflict is going to go on and I don't think the conflict is worth very much because the idea is for Africa to prosper. Um, we know that the name Africa was extended from a province in North Africa called Afrique. We know the Africans had names for Africa before the arrival of the European. We know that Africans had uh, we know that Ethiopia is a Greek word, while Ethiopia is a Greek word, means the land of the burnt faced people. There were names Africans called themselves before the Greeks used this word, and this word prevailed as meaning Africans all over the world uh, for many years before the word Africa became the word that meant Africa in total. I don't think this argument is the major stumbling block. I think the major stumbling block is to unify African people across all cultural and national lines and religious lines. And that whether you're Muslim or Christian or whoever you are, if you're an African person, then being an African should take uh, some kind of precedent. I totally agree with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Clark, I think I'd like to uh, have a preamble and say that I believe that uh, power, the seat of power rests in religion and politics. And uh, you dealt today, ton tonight, mostly with the, with the politics. And I have a feeling, though you did uh, mention our spirituality, I have a feeling that our confusion at present is, uh, is based on the fact that we don't have a, a sense of a, a, a religion. Uh, I am of the opinion that the Bible testifies to the fact that the children of Israel uh, are African people and, and the children of Israel are right here. Uh, I, 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 I feel, this is my own belief, that we as a people have to reclaim the Bible and try and take out the white in it and uh, accept it as, uh, as what it is, as ours, and uh, that that might somehow help us to unify and to get out of this predicament because though we have close to 30, 35 million Africans in this country, we can no way help to determine America's policy towards Africa. Uh, even when our, uh, our leadership get into the politi political arena, like uh, um, General Powell, is there more to serve the evil of this empire than he is to serve us, uh, 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 African people. 
uh, I wonder if you can say anything to a link, linking us back religiously, back to Africa. I can link you back to Africa in a spiritual way much better. The Yoruba reli religion, what you refer to the Yoruba religion, was a form of spirituality. If you call it religion, that's your prerogative. But it was a, a way of life, a spiritual and cultural way of life. What you call voodoo or voodoo was a cultural and spiritual way of life. And uh, I have no fight with the Bible being a former Baptist Sunday school teacher and in fact, it was the Bible that drove me into teaching history because I wanted, I, ha, I, I just couldn't deal with all those white images and those white angels. And I didn't believe that if God is love, I just didn't believe God left us out of his book. And uh, I wish you would read some of the books written about Bible writing such as Sir James Frazier's three-volume work, Folklore of the Old Testament. The Bible is part folklore, Jewish folklore copied from Africa. And uh, many of the stories in the Bible was told to illustrate truth. I'm not arguing with that, the moral, uh, the moral basis of truth. I'm arguing with the over-dependency on it. Because too many times I think we take our burden to the Lord and leave it there. Now, if the Lord has given you two good feet and limbs to carry the feet, two good eyes and sense of smell, sense of taste, a sense of proportion and common sense, enough sense to take care of your body to keep it healthy, I think God has done his job in a lot of cases and, and, and that we shouldn't just take our burden to him and leave it there because he's equipped us to handle the burden. <laughs> then, then if we are in his image, then part of the spirituality of God is inside of us and I don't think we call, we don't walk this earth God-like so that we can call on the God within ourselves. If God put a piece of himself and it's part of this, his own spiritual self inside of us, I just don't think we made the best use of it. And sometimes uh, Jesus' dependency becomes a form of addiction and keeps you from doing for yourself what God has equipped you to do. I'm not arguing with uh, an understanding of Bible. I'm, I'm arguing with the fact that uh, must you put all the burdens on him and take none for yourself. And uh, I remember there's a beautiful hymn in one of our spirituals, Must Jesus bear his cross alone and all the world goes free? Say, so, well, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. How well are you handling your cross? <laughs> uh, I, I'd just like to say that uh, Jesus also said that uh, you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and those things to God that are God's. And it seemed to me that we as African people, worshiping a white Christ, worshiping the cross, we are rendering ourselves unto the white man. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're rendering what we should be rendering to God, to a, a false image. And in the Bible, it constantly uh, rebukes us to not to, to worship images, images of any kind. And, and, and since we've been with a white man, that's all we've been doing. It seems to me that the reason we, you know, even though our economic uh, empowerment, we all seem to go towards a white man to, 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 for him to satisfy us in that way as opposed to, to, to taking that to God. Uh, uh, 
and let him show us, uh, guide us. <laughs> no, you, 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 you are right, but look, e each people, each people except us creates an image of God that resemble themselves. One of the main reasons why the Japanese came back having had two atomic bombs thrown on them, and having been defeated in war. Now the people who defeated them are now begging them for commercial space. What did they do? What did the Japanese refuse to let that enemy take away from them? And what did we lose? The Japanese refused to let their enemy take away their self-confidence in their concept of God as they conceived him to be. You have a concept of God as conceived by your slave master. I, I'm not saying leave God. I'm not saying leave religion. I'm saying look at it your way. Look at it through your eyes and look at an image that resembles you. Inasmuch as everybody in the world is doing it except you, ask yourself the question, why am I doing it? Uh, peace, Dr. Clark. That was an excellent lecture. And once again, I'd like to thank you. Um, the, my question refers to the, um, the people of North Africa called the Berbers. Now, a lot of people, when you talk about African history, they, um, like a lot of people that want to um, argue whether, um, whether, whether, whether um, African people were actually in control of North Africa or the people of North Africa were actually Africans themselves. They constantly use the, um, the Berbers to try to highlight them in some type of positive light. I just want to know just like basically just who are the Berbers <coughs> and just who are, um, are the indigenous people to Africa? Or the, um, do they have any type of um, significance you know, to us? Or, you know, are, they, are these foreign invaders that came in? You know, I just want, and um, another question I'd like to um, also ask you about someone like Marwan Gaddafi, for instance. Now, a lot of brothers and sisters um, constantly, my personal opinion, right, I believe that his, his sole allegiance is to Arabia. That anything like when, he, when he's, um, he's working in agriculture and stuff like that, it's not really the benefit the Africans, per se. It's just that I look at Marwan Gaddafi as somebody just basically anti-Western, and anything that he can do against the European, he's just going to do it. And any assistance that he can get from anybody, he's just going to use that assistance to gain his personal agenda, which is to help his Arab, his, his Arab mom, half of him. And my question is, like, um, what, what is your opinion of Muammar Gaddafi, like, in a situation like where he's um, building Muslim temples and training Muslim missionaries to send them out throughout Africa, to Muslimize the continent? And also, I'd like to ask your opinion of um, the situation in Panama and the Panamanian invasion. One thing. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Muammar Gaddafi. <laughs> no, uh, Gaddafi is an Islamic fanatic, and his role, as he sees it, is to try to Islamize the world. His loyalty is to Islam, to Islam and the Arabs. Some years ago, when he was sending some Libyans to Europe for education, he told them crudely, you're going to Europe to be educated and not to choose wives. And remember, I want you to come back and make good Arabs. And you cannot make a good Arab between the legs of a European woman. That's cruel. But you know one thing? Someone need to tell some Africans the same thing. <laughs> I have fortunately met Gaddafi twice. I've been in Libya. His, his secretary of state is a black man, Shahati. And I met Shahadi, and when any time a delegate go to Libya, if I'm not in it, Shahadi want to know why. <laughs> so I've been invited to Libya 
at their expense more times than I've had time to go. I've only gone twice. Qaddafi has two books he calls the Green Books. Is his basic policy. Some of it borders on the stereotype. He spreads money around to buy up as many Africans as he possibly can. And he's been successful in buying up quite a few. <laughs> I belong to an organization called the International Organization to End All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And I attended a meeting of, uh, of that organization over the weekend in, in uh, Sarasota, Florida. That first million came from Qaddafi. And we sat around, among other things, we devote most of our time to the South African situation and the Arab-Israeli situation. Kind of rich anti-Zionist Jews and upper middle class whites. And I was wondering, what the hell am I doing? They got <laughs> I have a three million dollar budget. And do you know what the great sadness was? We are dipping into our reserve at the rate of $90,000 a year. At this rate, we got to raise some big money someplace. Kuwait has promised us a half a million three years ago and have not delivered the money. We got a million in a bank in London is drawing less than 6% interest. And why are we letting that money hang out in England when we could do better in Switzerland? <laughs> Came time for lunch. Can you imagine an old sharecropper son like me whose father made $18 one week, <coughs> which is the largest sum he ever made in a whole week. <coughs> and we used to go to school with paper and shoes. Can you imagine me sitting around with people like that? When it got for dinner, the argument was on the relative merits of Johnny Walker, red or Johnny Walker black. <laughs> my, my, and my father came out of his grave. <laughs> He said, boy, you must be crazy. Get the hell out of there. <laughs> My point is that people raise vast sums of money, supposedly on our, on our misery, and they don't do nothing about our misery but raise more money <laughs> and control it. Now, there was only two of us in the meeting. And one was the cha chair in the meeting in Africa, in South Africa. He had to find it. He had to let them know he's chairing the meeting because they were talking over him and around him. <laughs> and I have to let them know that the organization was found on the plight of the discriminated. We are the only two here who's been discriminated. <laughs> <laughs> Will somebody hear what we got to say? <laughs> No, he asked about Panama. Yeah. I don't have much to say about Panama. In fact, this is two gangsters fell out, and <laughs> <laughs> one tried to ice the other one. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> one more question after the system. That's it. First of all, doc, Dr. Clark, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to sit at your feet and sup, sip from the fountain of knowledge that you possess. Sound like a former student. <laughs> <laughs> now, my question is, uh, what, in your opinion, is the best means to reach our people and bridge the gap between our people and the African people in the sense that, so that they can see that we are all in this together. 
to overcome the divisiveness, just as you mentioned, when people maintain, well, I'm not American black, I'm Trinidadian or Jamaican. Now, how do we overcome this? Because this is the only way we can reach the unity we need to confront the enemy. Well, if, we, if we're going to survive, we're going to have to find a way, and I think it's going to have to begin with some closed doors and some hard talk among us, then the converted, we're going to have to go out and convert some others. It should be said in all fairness, in spite of the dissension that sometimes exists between Caribbean Americans and black Americans, there are some Caribbean Americans who never bought this idea of one iota. Some Caribbean Americans who from the very beginning melted into and blended into the black American population, served them well until the day they died. And I know one that the Cave brothers, of Brennan Cave and his brother, who's still alive, who was a dermatologist here in Brooklyn, and I, Herbert died. And Brennan, who I have an appointment with next Monday, is still alive, and we're still getting along best in that uh, uh, there are still some communities, uh, Caribbeans married to African Americans and vice versa. But we have to realize that while we adopted some of the artificial values of our respective slave masters, we're still one people and we're not going to make it without each other because without each other we have no place to go. This is going to take a lot of talking, but I think it might help if we had some good simplified histories of both of us so we can I mean, get to know each other, you know, much better because you can favorably compare the slave revolts in the Caribbean with the slave revolts over here. You can compare the free man and his activity in the Caribbean with the free man, the black New England free man and their building of newspapers and magazines over here and the role the Caribbean played in the colonization movement. We've done so much together, we need to stop all the nonsense because it was Prince Hall from Barbados that built our Masons, and it was Robert Campbell from Jamaica who went with Martin Delaney out to Liberia, uh, Nigeria and such a place. It was Russ Warm, another Jamaican, that one of the editors of Freedom's Journal. There are too many Caribbean personalities who could not have existed in their respective islands have found a, an intellectual home and a physical home in the United States. Mar if Marcus Garvey were alive today, uh, walking down the streets of Jamaica, some disranged Jamaican would stone him to death, call him a fool. Marcus Garvey failed twice in Jamaica, and if he was alive today, he would still fail in Jamaica, because th there is no Garveyism in the Caribbean islands. There's some Garvey talk, but there's no Garveyisms. No Garveyism. We need to get this across. That the finest minds the Caribbeans have ever produced flourished in the United States. There's no place in the, uh, they flourished in the United States because if they lived in the Caribbean, they'd be killed. There's no place in the Virgin Islands where Hubert Harrison would have thrived for a week. One of the great five, he was the man that introduced Marcus Garvey to his first uh, wide audience and Edmund Blyden from also from the Virgin Islands was the connecting link between the Caribbeans and African and Afro-Americans until the end of the 19th century. He died in 1912. Look, we need to stop all this nonsense about don't, not knowing each other. If we don't know each other, let's get to know each other. Amen. The whole idea of Pan-Africanism started in the Caribbean Islands. The framework of it started in the idea of the unification of African people throughout the world started in the Caribbean, and you can't stop all your nonsense and unite. I mean, I mean the Pan-Africanism was started by three Trinidadians, H. Sylvester Williams, George Padmore, and C. L. R. James. 
And when you look at your, your, the Caribbean contribution to unity, then you could draw on your own sources and, um, and affect the union between Africans and Afro African Americans and, and learn to what extent the Caribbean islands are still conservative. And ask why is it that Jamaicans own more stores in Brooklyn than they do in Kingston? Because in Kingston they wouldn't stand a chance. We once we get to compare these, they make these similarities, and the people say, oh, "The Caribbean is a go-getter. He does this, that. They leave the lazy American." Look, stop kidding yourself. Blacks in Durham, North Carolina, got more got more wealth than all the blacks in Jamaica. One place, Durham, North Carolina. Then there are places in the United States where not a single black American ever saw a West Indian. Never saw one. But you assume that it's all over. Well, people who lack opportunities is sometimes they come to a country when they see them, they seize on them, brother. But, but we've had a different kind of oppression, different kind of atmosphere. You've grown up, and many times Caribbeans grew up in an island where they're majority, and you have schoolmasters and police constables and <laughs> petty judges. A lot of us grew up in, I grew up in, a, in a Columbus, Georgia, where a white man drove the trash truck, the garbage truck. Black people kept from everything mechanical. And my own father was debating with someone about the black man could handle a steam shovel because they weren't permitted to handle that kind of technology. And my father climbed up aboard the steam shovel and pulled the wrong lever and dipped the thing into the pond and worked in a brickyard. It had to be good catfishing there. And <laughs> he brought up a whole scoop full of cat. <laughs> Biggest catfish I ever saw in my life. <laughs> I'm saying that if you grow up seeing things, you grow up with confidence.